Here is the question that I asked at the end of the previous part of this lecture. And the main issue here is noting that the spring is not in the system. And so all of the bar charts A and B, which include a spring potential energy, are incorrect because the spring potential energy is part of the environment's energy. Now look at the work done. The external force that's doing work is the force that the spring exerts on the mass. The mass moves down, and so the force displacement vector points down. And so since the force displacement vector and the force point in opposite directions, that tells us that the work is negative. And so the correct answer is C. We've now seen quite a few times that friction is very complicated, and so now let's see another way that friction will complicate our lives. When we're doing an energy analysis, we often have to be very careful with friction. Let's think about a person pulling a box across a floor using a rope or something, and the floor is not being included in the system. Friction is going to generate thermal energy at this boundary between the floor and the box. The problem here is that we don't know how much of that thermal energy ends up in our system. Some of it is going to go to warming up the box and will be in our system, and some of it will warm up the floor and will be outside of our system. So our energy accounting is now quite difficult. We know the system gains thermal energy, but we don't know by how much. We know that that external kinetic friction force will do some amount of negative work, but without knowing how to calculate the change in thermal energy of the system, we have no way of calculating how much work has been done. What if we include the surface in the system? That makes things much simpler. Now we know that all of that thermal energy is in the system, and so what we have going on is just that chemical energy is converted to thermal energy. We still don't know how to calculate that thermal energy change, but we will in a future lecture. For now, all I want to say is that we should never choose a system which would result in kinetic friction acting along the boundary of the system. In other words, if there's kinetic friction between two objects, you should really include both objects in your system. Static friction is in one way simpler and in another way quite a bit more complicated. Let me just remind you, kinetic friction causes irreversible state changes, and so that means it produces thermal energy. And that's our reason for the rule that we should never have kinetic friction acting along the system boundary. We have this question of where the thermal energy ends up. Well, we want it to end up in our system all in our system to make our energy accounting easier. But static friction causes reversible state changes. It's really just like a spring force acting on microscopic scales, and so there's no thermal energy produced by static friction. So we don't run into this problem of figuring out where the thermal energy is, and so it causes no problem if we define our system with the static friction acting across the system boundary. So since it's okay to define a system where the agent of a static friction acting on the system is an external object, that means there's the potential for static friction to be able to do work on a system. Let's look at whether that happens when you walk. So I'm going to define the system as you. You're starting from rest and speeding up, and we know that you do that by pushing back on the floor, so the floor pushes forward on you. That's static friction. And you are gaining kinetic energy. And what is the source of that gain in energy? I'm going to do some very subtle foreshadowing here. My subtle foreshadowing is that I'm going to tell you something, and it's going to turn out to be wrong. So I'm going to tell you that you gain kinetic energy because of work by friction. But if you think about it carefully, you'll see that that has to be wrong. Think about the point of application of the force, your foot. Your foot doesn't move, and so the force displacement vector is zero, which means that static friction force is not doing any work. So where did the energy come from? Well, if you think about it, this makes sense, because the source of the energy to get you going wasn't in the ground. That would be awfully nice if you could just sit back and relax and the ground would get you going. 
The source of the energy was that you used your own chemical energy to get yourself going. But let's look at another situation. Here's a box on a conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt is speeding up, and the box does not slip, so it's being carried along by the conveyor belt at the increasing speed of the conveyor belt. We know that the free body gut diagram for the box will have a perpendicular force by the conveyor belt and a gravitational force by the earth. The box is speeding up and the only way that's possible is if there's a force here to the right. And there's only one force that can possibly be because the only thing it's in contact with is the conveyor belt. So this must be the frictional force by the conveyor belt, and because it's not slipping, this is a static friction. So static friction is causing the box to speed up. And does this force do work? Well, again, the point of application is at the point where the box is touching the conveyor belt. But this time, the point of application is moving along with the box. And so there is a non-zero force displacement vector in the direction of motion. And so that tells us right away that the friction is doing positive work. So we see that while we have to be careful about static friction sometimes and whether it does work, because frequently its point of application doesn't move, it's quite possible for a static friction force to do work.